Hey everyone, Diavolo here, and I think to start off this massive video going over every single curse technique inside of the verse, that we firstly delve into the teachers of each school and their respective techniques, then work our way through the rest of them from there. Of course, not every single person will be mentioned, because sometimes two people might have the same technique, and some sorcerers don't even have an innate technique or inherited one. Also, for you disgusting anime onlys, this will include a bunch of stuff in the manga, so you have been warned. Getting into it though, and being one of the strongest people instead of the verse, rip the strongest though, Satoru Gojo is equipped with a plethora of different abilities that we've seen being used in a variety of different ways. Firstly, putting him already a mile above the rest, Gojo is born with these bad boys. A six eyes bearer has immense perception and unrivaled visual prowess, far beyond that of any other sorcerer. Their eyesight is comparable to like a high definition infrared camera, and they can easily see things from several kilometers away. At all times, these six eyes are constantly active, kind of like a passive trait that you're unable to deactivate. Weirdly, and I'm assuming because they're like a physical body part the person was born with, they don't seem to actually take up any curse energy itself, more just placing a physical burden on the user if the eyes are uncovered for an extended period of time. The six eyes are without issue, able to observe the flow of cursed energy, gifting the user with the added ability to read an individual's curse technique and determine its function. They can even differentiate between different types of cursed energy, which in turn allows the user to figure out who they might be facing. The six eyes also allows for the extremely precise manipulation of cursed energy, down to an atomic level. This not only allows the bearer to operate the limitless through the complex control of cursed energy, but enables them to process it with great efficiency as well. Speaking of the Limitless technique, next up is obviously Limitless. At the base level and just like the eyes themselves, Limitless is an innate technique which is passed down inside of the Gojo family. This technique grants its user an almost absolute control over an untangible space through curse energy manipulation. In turn, anything that approaches the infinity slows down and never reaches the user. This is because the technique takes the finite amount of space between the two subjects and divides it an infinite amount of times. In maths, no matter how many times you divide a number, it will never reach zero. Instead, you're left with incredibly tiny fractional parts that are almost impossible to measure with our like basic human eyes. Now, imagine if we could bring this mathematical concept to life, and that's pretty much how we get this insanely broken ability of Limitless. Due to just how brilliant and in-depth of a technique that it is, Limitless has three standard and one non-standard technique beyond this. The first of these is the Curse Technique Lapse or Blue. This remarkable technique not only cranks up the cursed energy output to unprecedented levels, but also generates the power to attract. This is achieved by amplifying the limitless and bringing the conceptual impossibility of negative distance into reality. It's just freaking mind blowing. This forces the surrounding space to try and fill in the gap by pulling violently towards the source of the previously mentioned impossibility, creating the magnet-like effect. Plus, I guess we can just chuck in the maximum output version of this technique, just to, you know, like, pad the already ridiculously long video, which is obviously, you know, curse technique maximum curse energy output blue. <laughs> But, you know, either way, moving on to the next of these uh, three here, the second of the three is the reversal of Limitless. So, unlike how Blue played on the effects of Curse Energy, Curse Technique Reversal Red is the opposite as it refers to the effects of the Strengthening Technique and brings the divergence of infinity into reality, generating the power to repel. Gojo is able to achieve his first use of it at his battle against Toji after he was physically pushed to his limits. So it just shows how, like, technically hard it was for him to actually achieve this, this ability. As he said after he returned, this is achieved by flowing reversed curse energy into the power of Limitsless, creating a repelling effect that's over two times stronger in comparison to Blue. Of course, the reason he failed to use Red initially against the paper bag head dude was because Gojo's application of reverse curse technique, or RCT, wasn't exactly there yet. While we are here talking about RCT, I might as well explain that reverse curse technique, or what I say a lot of the time, RCT or RTC because I go and mess it up, technically isn't a curse technique, but a special type of sequence that takes cursed energy and reverses it into positive energy. It's a very complex ability and is mainly used to heal human bodies. Don't ask me why it's not specifically a technique, I just know Giga Akatami came out at one point and specifically said that it wasn't a technique. It's just like an adaption of cursed energy, I don't know. As we learned recently, Reverse Curse Technique also allows someone to restore their exhausted curse technique. However, it's important to note that you can't simultaneously recover your physical body and your curse technique. It's one or the other. What I do find most messed up, like 
Giga is actually crazy, is that rejuvenating a worn out curse technique involves damaging the section of the brain where these techniques are imprinted, and then healing it using a reverse curse technique. Bruh. Another ability that Gojo is only able to use due to his six eyes is the advanced technique, Long Distance Teleportation. Like the name says, a limitless user is able to use spatial manipulation to teleport long distances, although the user can only teleport themselves instantly with a hand signal. This is achieved by compressing the space between the user's location and their desired destination. To teleport multiple people, the limitless user will need to draw a sorcery circle large enough to hold the amount of people they want to teleport. Lastly, out of the techniques only a limitless user can achieve, and another advanced one, we have the hollow technique, purple. Like I mentioned before, red and blue make up both the first main two abilities found within limitless. Hollow purple, the third, is the fusion of both of them, a secret ability only known to a few within the Gojo family. Straight up, this has been said so many times like now that we think of it, but we're still yet to even meet someone else other than Gojo from the Gojo clan. But you know, either, either way, putting that aside, this ability represents the motion of blue and the reversal of red, a fusion of convergence and divergence that collides both infinities to generate an imaginary mass that destroys anything it touches. Which is actually crazy, it's just, you know, like Gigo was like, how can I make something so broken that it destroys anything it touches? Oh, it's an imaginary mass that will destroy anything it touches. <laughs> so yeah, fair enough, it's probably like plasma or something. Either way, next up, and here is a personal favourite of mine just due to how many times Mappa snaps with every single application of it in the series, Black Flash. As everyone's surely heard, so I'll be quick with this one. Black Flash is a distortion in space that occurs when cursed energy is applied within 0.000001 seconds of a physical hit. When a sorcerer is able to achieve this, the curse energy flashes the colour black and the destructive power of their strike is equal to a normal hit to the power of 2.5. So to figure out whatever that equals, you just go and take what a normal hit is, chuck it in the exponent calculator and you'll get the answer that you want. Next up out of the faculty that actually has an ability we can talk about is the big man himself, Masamichi Yaga, the 50 year old man with a crippling plushy addiction who actually has one of the strongest and feared over abilities inside of the series, if you're higher up. Unlike Mahito's manipulation of curses, Masamichi doesn't use people but instead is able to infuse the dolls he creates with a curse energy core in order to bring the inanimate objects to life and control them with an incantation. He has developed a wide variety of different cursed corpses including Panda, Tsukamoto, Kathy and of course the little man himself, Takudu, who, you know, chilled out with Yuji while he was watching Lord of the Rings. The reasoning I give behind him being feared over is actually because the potential threat of a multitude of sentient cursed corpses nearly led all of the higher ups to promote Masamichi to special grade, but instead they placed an indefinite restriction on him, meaning that he wasn't allowed to create a multitude of cursed corpses. Since that point, Masamichi has kept his other creations a secret within a forest protected by Tengen. Well, these two have kind of been fitting to stick together if you know what I mean. Sadly, the guy who dealt the finishing blow to Masamichi, Yoshinobu Kakuganji, had an even more lethal ability. Looking like a rock star and using a technique that we don't know exactly the name of but have an understanding of how it works, Gakuganji's technique uses his body as a form of sound amplification device, amplifying anything that he plays on his electric guitar and in turn it launches a wave of amped up electrical curse energy at his opponent. Next up, and being an avid lover of beer, Utahime and her ability comes with no surprise. Solo Forbidden Arena is an innate technique that creates a zone around the sorcerer that temporarily amplifies the curse energy of any person within range, including herself. Solo Forbidden Arena is not particularly suited for combat as it requires preparation time and is best applied to enhancing allies. I haven't mentioned this as of yet, I probably could have with Gojo, but I rambled on with some of his abilities for a bit too long. The technique can actually be elevated into a ritual using incantations, hand signs, dance and music. By including all of these steps, the technique's effectiveness can be raised to 120%. This however doesn't just work for Utahime, all sorcerers are actually able to elevate their techniques with incantations, it's just more or less a time based thing during battle. So that brings all of the teachers inside of Jujutsu Kaisen both at Kyoto and Jujutsu Tech schools to an end. If I don't mention any specific characters and their techniques, it's either because we haven't seen them use one or they share in one with another character that I've already spoken about, like Shoko kind of only has the reverse curse technique and I mentioned that there with Gojo. But either way, moving on forward. When it comes to Yuji, he doesn't have any innate or inherited technique, however he is equipped with his own unique effect. 
PS, uh, Yuji might be like a few chapters away from learning a curse technique, or he might even have it right now and we're about to find out like two days after I drop this freaking video. So if he does end up having one, it'll be awesome to see him gain something in the end. Like, Man's used Divergent Fist for how long now, and I'm assuming it'll probably have something to do with body swapping after that short section of him practicing with Kusakabe. When it comes to the big Divergent Fist itself, simply, if Yuji strikes with his fist using a thin layer of cursed energy, a second wave of cursed energy is unleashed a few moments afterward, effectively creating two impacts with one punch. This is as Kojo said earlier on in the series, because Yuji is too physically quick, his cursed energy lags behind and takes time to catch up, creating that double impact. Second out of the series main trio, Megami Fushiguro is stocked up with an arsenal of Shikigami that originate from an inherited technique passed down inside of the Zenin clan. This is, of course, the illustrious Ten Shadows technique. This technique grants the user the complete manifestation of shadows, allowing someone to hide in them or store objects. It also grants them the possibility to summon up to 10 different Shikigami using a specific correlating hand signal and the shadows as an intermediary between the shadow and human realms. When someone inherits the Ten Shadows technique, they initially receive two divine dogs, from which the other Shikigami can be summoned with an exorcism ritual where the user must defeat the Shikigami in order to make them submit. Throughout the series, we see Big Megami throw up his gang signs a multitude of times, pretty much allowing us to see all ten of his chosen Shikigami. The first divine dogs are a pair of twin wolves that can comfortably take out lower grade curses. After having the White Hound killed by the Finger Bearer, another application of the Ten Shadows technique is seen when Megami uses the liquid remains to mix the walls together, turning them into one larger and much stronger Shikigami, the Divine Dog Totality. Totality is strong enough to contend with Special Grade Curse Spirit, making it one of Megami's strongest offensive Shikigami. Probably my favourite out of all of his Shikigami, just due to the fact that it can fly, would have to be Noe. Noe is a winged Shikigami with an extremely high top speed and electrical wings. It can help one person by carrying them while flying to increase their mobility, and can attack with its heavy wings charged with electricity, shocking anyone it hits and leaving them temporarily paralysed. In addition to basic offensive applications, Noe's speed and wings can also be used defensively to shield its user from any potential harm. Third of the known Shikigamis, Toad, is a large frog Shikigami that can support its master using its long tongue. I'm assuming that you could probably ride it too, or use it like a stepping stone as we saw with Nanami, but it's mainly seen using the tongue. Its tongue can actually be used to ensnare its master's target in a tough hold, and is strong enough to throw those same targets around with its tongue. Its large size also allows it to carry injured humans in its mouth for protection. But, like I mentioned, the biggest upside to the Toad is the tongue and its speed. Next up, Bigorochi or the Great Serpent is a giant snake Shikigami that can quickly attack and ensnare its user's targets within a constrictive hold. The snake seems to be more of a sneak attack like weapon as the user can use it to attack from the shadows at a high speed. The Great Serpent's size also allows it to overpower large curses, possibly even swallowing them in one go, and it can also be used to keep a target in place while other Shikigami launch combination attacks on it. So, not including uh, Sukuna Shikigami, as we'll get to those later on in the video, Megami's Max Elephant is definitely his most explosive Shikigami. As we've all seen, the Shikigami is capable of spewing large, violent torrents of water from its trunk that are capable of pushing back or even drowning the intended target. It can also be used to crush its master's target within its immense weight. However, the cost of cursed energy to summon the Shikigami is huge in comparison to others. This in turn, obviously depending on like who has the Ten Shadows technique, will allow them to summon it once. Being a polar opposite to Max Elephant, Megami's sixth Shikigami, Rabbit Escape, is a massive swarm of rabbit-like Shikigami that serve as more of a distraction for the user than an attack in itself. Upon activating the technique, dozens, like, I'm actually unsure even if we get an exact number, but a bunch of rabbits fill the area to distract the opponent, allowing the summoner to escape danger or use them to his advantage and attack the confused opponent. Lastly, the big man himself, Maharaga, who I don't even know if I should include as a part of the Ten Shadows technique or talk about more with Sakuna, but we'll just do him here because he obviously is a part of the Ten Shadows technique. To summon this being, it's slightly different. Unlike hand signs or signals with others, all you need to do with Maharaga is extend both arms forward. On top of this, an incantation is required to bring him forth and begin the ritual. This being, though, is by far the most powerful Shikigami available to be summoned by someone with this Ten Shadows technique. However, no one in the history of the Zenin family has ever been able to force it to submit. Unlike all other Shikigami, Maharaga is equipped with its own kind of techniques. 
Firstly, this dude is armed with a weapon called the Sword of Extermination. This blade is attached to the Shikugami's forearm and enveloped in positive curse energy, making it especially effective against cursed spirits. Secondly, the beam possesses the ability to adapt to any and all phenomena. How this works is that, say, if it's injured by a particular attack, the eight-handed wheel will turn, allowing Maharaga to adapt. This can take up to a few spins, depending on just how in-depth the technique is trying to adapt is. After all of these spins are needed to adapt complete, Maharaga will be able to counter it. This also works offensively as well, allowing Maharaga to figure out a way around the technique so he's able to deal damage. Third of the series' main trio, Nobara Kugasaki, the country girl, actually boasts large reserves of cursed energy and is an expert at manipulating it to her will. This isn't specifically mentioned in the anime or manga, but in the fan book we learn where Nobara got her ability from. Like Megami, the straw doll technique is passed down inside of the Kugasaki family, with Nobara specifically inheriting the technique from her grandmother. The straw doll technique incorporates a tool set that features a hammer, nails, and straw doll effigy that has the ability to greatly improve the user's curse energy. By channeling her curse energy through the tools, Nobara can utilize a number of different techniques including sharing damage between her straw doll and her target. These nails are sent into the user's target using a hammer to hit and propel them forward as projectiles. The curse energy allows the nails to be freely manipulated, giving the user free range of motion and preparation for that said strike. If the target is hit by the nails, the curse energy flowing through them can be used to deal even further damage. Once hitting a target, the user of straw doll manipulation can use an extension technique. The first of these is resonance, which applies curse energy to the user's target using a straw doll as an effigy. The user will generally use one body part of their target to create the link and then use resonance to apply damage to more critical appendages of the opponent's body. For example, by placing a curse technique severed arm on the straw doll and striking it with a nail using a hammer, the nails can be used to pierce the targeted curse's heart. The effectiveness of this technique varies on the opponent's skill level, the targeted body part, and the strength of the connection to the user's target. If a link is made to multiple opponents, resonance will injure them all at the same time. The second and last extension technique we've seen from the straw doll technique, hairpin, allows the user to greatly enhance the output of their curse energy. Curse energy shrouding the nails will expand with explosive force, highly magnifying their destructive capabilities. I think this works by placing some sort of binding valve on the nails that means they'll be destroyed after the technique is used. Moving forth, and I'm going to stick Junipei's thing in here because I didn't really know where to stick him elsewhere in the video and I guess he, he kind of would have been a first year. Either way, Junipei Shikigami Moondrex takes the form of a translucent blue jellyfish with a body large enough to cover its user. It has two black eyes and thin yellow tentacles draping from its body. Moondrex is capable of reshaping its tentacles as well as portions of its body to form stingers. It's also capable of hitting people with poison in its attacks. So next up, Kyoto Jujutsu Tech actually has a first year in Arata Nita. This dude isn't by any means a physical fighter and is more seen as a coordinator type of like sorcerer. To be honest, he reminds me of a manager, probably just due to like the black suit that he wears throughout the uh, story. His ability though, Painkiller, is a technique that allows Arata to stop existing injuries from getting any worse. The user of Painkiller can't specifically heal wounds, but they can stop bleeding and reduce the pain for anyone it's applied to. The downside of this technique is mainly how it doesn't allow the user to heal anyone, just sustain their injuries. Moving forward now out of the first years and onto the first of the second years at Kyoto Tech. Mai Zenin, who doesn't actually possess an inherited technique like the majority of other characters. However, she does have her own one that she created over time. This technique is also seen in another character called Yorizu that makes her appearance during the Culling game. So we'll speak a little bit about that here. This ability, Construction, is an inefficient technique that consumes most of the user's curse energy to create something from nothing. Unlike creating objects with a domain, things constructed by this technique will not disappear once the spell is finished. However, creating something from nothing uses an immense amount of curse energy, because you know, you've got to have drawbacks from creating something out of absolutely nothing, which obviously results in a harsh backlash on the user's body. So, depending on how much curse energy the user of this ability might have, it will allow them a differing level and complexity of things they might be able to create. Sadly for Mai and her pathetically small pool of curse energy, all she was able to produce is a single bullet per day. I should bring it up as well, but Mai was also able to create a cursed tool sword at the cost of her own life. 
Some of the cooler extinction techniques though that we have seen from construction come from Yorizu and her battle against the King of Curses. First of those, liquid metal is pretty much how it sounds, a construction of liquid metal that's changeable in shape and volume, with stable physical properties due to like the semi-autonomous curse energy that's manipulating it. This ability here almost works as like a base for the construction technique to build other things off of. For example, the user of this technique could use the liquid metal to create an insect armor, which is specialized in adapting to a plethora of different insects abilities and functions. Doing this will inherently help with sustaining the user's curse energy for a longer period of time, while simultaneously enhancing their speed, strength and durability. Lastly, a user of construction is one of the only beings able to make a perfect sphere. By using that liquid metal and shaping it into a sphere, the user is able to make a perfect one. A true sphere has no contact area and generates infinite pressure, as a result making it absolutely untouchable. It's kind of like Gojo's hollow purple and the idea that it's an unstoppable imaginary mass of curse energy that will destroy utterly anything in its path. Next up on the food chain of abilities inside of Jujutsu Kaisen comes from the traitor himself, Kokichi Muta. So we kind of have a similar ability to Kokichi's puppet manipulation and Masamichi's cursed corpse manipulation, but they are inherently different. Unlike Masamichi who can give the doll control, Kokichi himself controls these puppets with his adept use of curse energy. Sorry Maki, but because I'm mentioning a heavenly restriction now, I doubt I'll mention you at all throughout this video, so you know I'll chuck her in here with this here. This heavenly restriction is a restriction placed on someone and not a technique a person will perform themselves. It is explained to us as a binding that is placed upon a sorcerer's body when they are born. I'm not sure if this is an otherworldly uncontrollable feat or something the parents perform themselves. What we do know is that these bindings usually refer to limitations on the human body. This could be curse energy related or physically related. In exchange, the person with this restriction receives improved capabilities. Kikichi, who suffers from an extreme example of heavenly restriction, was gifted with vast amounts of curse energy that he used to control massive amounts of Mikamaru puppets remotely through puppet manipulation. Puppets such as Ultimate Mikamaru are capable of using explosive curse energy blasts that look like plasma beams among a bevy of other abilities. I should mention this as well, even though I feel like it's more of a barrier technique since it's related to the shadow style, but Miwa possesses the ability called Bato Sword Drawing. This ability is an IA or EA, I don't know how to say that word there, sword drawing technique, optimal for striking enemies situated directly in front of the user. It covers the blade with curse energy and rotates it, greatly improving the drawing speed. So the next second year who actually has an inherited technique is the mute legend Big Inumaki Toge and his cursed speech. Cursed speech is an inherited technique of the Inumaki family. It reinforces the user's words with cursed energy, which compels the listener to act or be acted upon based on those words. To execute cursed speech, the user must use a cursed tool with a particular set of seals on it. For example, the Mute King has seal markings on his cheeks and tongue. Whereas the original MC Yuta has a tool created by the Inumaki family, the Serpent Eyes and Fang, which has those same markings on it. Cursed speech is activated when the user utters words or commands aloud that are reinforced with cursed energy. This action, as I've said, compels the listener to act or be acted upon as a command. For example, a cursed speech user can command his opponent to stop moving, or for them to be crushed. The strength of this ability entirely depends on the skill of the user. As cursed speech uses language and is a more wild technique, it can make it dangerous to casually speak with other people. Civilians and anyone within the range of the user will be affected if they accidentally hear the wrong word. As a countermeasure, users of cursed speech tend to limit their casual language to certain safe words to avoid triggering cursed speech. Back when I first mentioned Masamichi, I didn't really know if I should include this cuddly bear as a part of his cursed corpse manipulation or have Panda as his own person with his own techniques. Obviously I've decided the latter as this person is 100% his own person with his own abilities and feelings, like we all saw that pandas cry. Due to him being a puppet panda, Panda didn't exactly have the ability to inherit a technique. However, he instead possesses what's called Cursed Corpse Cores. Inside of him are three cores all with differing personalities and powers. Panda's body, the balanced and main form, the power form called Gorilla Mode, and the third core called Triceratops Mode. 
At base, Panda technically has three lives, but if any of these cores are damaged, Panda is unable to shift into that form until it recovers. By switching to his brother's core and going gorilla mode, Panda can transform into a muscular gorilla. Panda is much stronger and faster in this form, but at the cost of rapidly draining his curse energy. A secondary technique available while in gorilla mode, unblockable drumming beat, allows any strike Panda lands to resonate through the target's body. The idea behind this is similar to Yuji's divergent fist punch, in which even if the person blocks, they still feel some sort of like secondary damage resonate through them. Finally, by switching to his sister's big core, Panda can transform into Triceratops mode. Apparently this is the most destructive form, but as we haven't seen much from her so far, all we can do is take Panda's word for it. Panda apparently claims his sister's form destroys everyone who looks at her because of her shyness. However, the one time she did turn up, it didn't exactly go too well for her. Ah, now we get to talk about the ability thief, the Kakashi wannabe of JJK, the original MC, Maki's girl, Big Yuta Akotsu, and the plethora of abilities that this guy's got stored up. While connected to Rika, through his ring, Yuta can fully manifest the Queen of Curses. This is called a complete Rika manifestation. Rika also has the ability to store a wide range of curse tools and can equip them to Yuta at will. There is a time limit on her full manifestation though, as he can only maintain a sustained connection with Rika and remain in this state for 5 minutes at a time. I'm assuming this is because the ring is like a doorway to whatever realm the unraveled Rika now abides in. While connected to Rika, Yuta can actually copy innate techniques of other people and use them for himself. He can even use multiple different techniques that he's copied in quick succession. Plus, once copying them while Rika is out, he can use those same abilities again whenever he wants. The conditions under which he can copy a technique are not fully known, but it is implied that he gained the ability to copy Uro's sky manipulation after Rika consumed her arm. So far out of the ones that we have seen, Yuta has been able to copy Cursed Speech, Sky Manipulation and Thin Icebreaker. On top of that, Yuta can only fire a directed blast of Cursed Energy when Rika is completely manifested. This is obviously called the Cursed Energy Blast and together they can fire a beam that is just shy of matching Ryu's Granite Blast. Putting Uro's abilities aside because we're going to speak more on them later, Yuta can also summon Shikigami using his hair as an intermediary. The Shikigami appear as small bats with heads similar to that of Rika's. They fly around the opponent to form a sphere-like domain that can slash anyone inside of it. Also, and just in case you thought this was an ability that Yuta had like created, Yuta copied this technique again off that uh, Druv Luck Dwala dude. Anyway, so that's all of these second years from both schools covered now, and I guess we better touch on the big dogs, the seniors. Hikari, Hikari, Hikari. Now, I initially thought I was going to be here for a year trying to explain this silly old technique. Then I realized it's his domain, I don't even have to worry about that. Akari's innate technique is still called Private Pure Love Train. This is a pachinko themed technique that is primarily applied through his domain expansion. The curse technique imbued into the domain manifests Private Pure Love Train, a pachinko game inspired by the previously mentioned romance manga series. However, the reason I bring it up as a solo technique is because Hikari can actually summon the visual effect indicators of the game, such as the shuttered doors outside of his domain. They can then be used to like catch, block, or even damage the opponents that he's facing. Next up, and uh, a big lover of the fever. Kurara Hoshi has probably one of those techniques that just make your brain rot with confusion. Like, how in the world do you even think this one up? This technique, named Love Rendezvous, assigns 5 stars with a southern cross shape in order to target curse energy. The 5 stars are a Mai, a Crux, Mimosa, Ganan, and Gakrux. In order to mark something with a star, the user must make physical contact with someone's curse energy. Anyone that has been marked will experience a sparkling light above their head when the technique is activated. They can also find the name of the star they've been marked with written somewhere on their body. Only one star can be placed on one person's curse energy at a time, but the same star can be applied to multiple different people simultaneously. This also includes the user, so if they've marked themselves with a star, they must remove it before then deciding to mark another object. If the user needs to mark multiple different objects with stars, the objects need to be charged by someone else's curse energy beforehand. Curse energy shared between a sorcerer and their Shikigami is considered the same by Love Rendezvous. The user can mark both the Shikigami owner and their Shikigami with the same star at the same time. 
They can even place a star on the sorcerer without touching him directly, simply by making contact with the Shikigami. If this happens, the one with the higher curse energy output will pull the other when attracted. Anyone marked with a star must follow a specific order if they want to attempt moving towards another star. If they don't follow the orderings, targets with the same star will attract each other making it impossible to escape. The determined route that you have to follow works by following the nearest star first and finishing at the furthest one away. The order that we have seen is Amai, Akrux, Mimosa, Ganan and Gakrux. Which, if you guys also want to look online, are the names of real stars and I'm pretty sure that is also like in sequence of closest to furthest away from Earth. Also, if someone is marked like with Mimosa, you know, like you can, you just have to go to Ganan then Gakrux to get out. You don't have to go back to Amai then go all the way through. Time to get away from the uh, mind-bending spatial abilities and move on to something a little bit more down to earth now. Momo Nishimaya is equipped with an innate technique called Tall Manipulation. Along with other broom related things, this technique grants the user the ability to levitate the tool, fly on the tool, or create gusts of winds imbued with curse energy. An extension of Tool Manipulation, Wind Scythe is used by swinging the user's broom as they ride it. This can effectively create strong gusts of curse energy infused wind, strong enough to push people back or even wound them. Do you feel it brother? I tell you, an arm is merely a decoration, but the act of applause is the acclamation of the soul itself. Himothy, Big Toto has one of the most simplistic abilities inside of the verse, but oh my lord can he abuse the absolute hell out of it and it's freaking fantastic to watch. Boogie Woggy, the body switching ability, activates when the user claps their hands together. Their technique switches the positions of the user and anything they desire. All they need to do is make sure whatever they intend to switch has some level of curse energy. A user of this ability doesn't actually just have to switch themselves as well, as they can also swap other people's locations as long as they have curse energy. That is kind of all we know about Boogie Woggy, there really isn't much to it like some of the other abilities out there. Another one of these highly complex abilities comes from a duo you could almost call father and son, the blood manipulation of Noritoshi Keimo and the big bro Choso. As it implies, blood manipulation is a curse technique that allows the user to control and shape their blood beyond its natural form or motion for a variety of effects. It can be used to manipulate every aspect of the user's blood, including composition, internal blood flow, plasma, pulse rate, body temperature, and red blood cells. It also allows them to control the blood outside of their body, as long as it belongs to the uh, user. External blood can be hardened or shaped to create mid-ranged projectiles. As with any curse technique, blood manipulation's efficiency and strength depend on who wields it. With this technique, we've seen two vastly different people use it. In my opinion, and due to him being human, Naruto Kamo's use of blood manipulation falls short to that of Choso's. This here is mainly for the fact that the user is limited by the amount of their own blood they have access to. Too much blood loss could obviously result in death, so users of this ability generally prepare blood bags or weapons dipped in their own blood in advance. Unless, you know, you're Choso and you're built completely differently. Also, another factor of blood manipulation is that the blood is poisonous to cursed spirits. The first of many extension techniques, Flowing Red Scale, increases the user's body temperature, pulse rate, and the number of red blood cells to give themselves greatly increased energy and physical capabilities. Flowing Red Scale Stack intensifies Flowing Red Scale in order to increase the user's physical capabilities to an even higher degree than normal. Third of this technique's extension techniques, Crimson Binding transforms blood into a widespread net that tightly ensnares the target. Slicing Exorcism is a long range attack that allows the user to slice or shoot their opponent. It can take the form of a quickly rotating disc of blood or a long stream of blood. Convergence is a baseline technique within blood manipulation. This technique is mainly used first in combination with others to perform an extension technique. Convergence is achieved when blood is compressed and condensed to its limit between the palms of the user. From that, a compressed blood sphere will be formed. Because it takes time to apply convergence to blood, the user is vulnerable against fast and quick attacks. After using convergence, a few options are available for a blood manipulation user. One of these, piercing blood, applies that compressed blood and uses it in a long ranged beam of blood that will pretty much go through anything it touches. Once skillfully reinforced with curse energy, it can reach the speed of sound, however any subsequent movement will cause it to slow. This ability is so deadly that if you do get hit by it without expecting the attack, you will be pierced through. 
Another option available after using Convergence is Supernova. To do this, the user will create small orbs of blood, then have those orbs shoot out in every direction like a buck shot. These smaller orbs of blood are somewhat hardened before they explode, adding to the damage that someone might receive. A quick utilization of Blood Manipulation's ability to harden blood, Blood Edge strengthens the user's blood density by rotating it at a high speed. Using some of those same properties, Blood Meteorite is used when the user hardens some of their blood to an almost crystallized level before throwing it at their target. It's most lethal within short ranges as the speed will drastically decrease over time. Moving on from one manipulator to another though, Suguru Ghetto and then subsequently Kenjaku have both been seen in use of this technique. As the name suggests, Curse Spirit Manipulation is a technique where, like the Ten Shadows technique, one can control a being, in this example, a Curse Spirit they were able to conquer in battle. Rather than exercise the Curse Spirit, the user can absorb them into a small black sphere before consuming them. Orally consuming this orb gives the user complete dominance over the curse, allowing them to summon them at any time in the future. If the difference in grade is two levels or more, the curse manipulator can absorb the curse spirit with practically no conditions attached. The user can extract the curse technique from semi-grade 1 and above curse spirits that they absorb, providing them with an immense arsenal of potential different moves. However, the quality of the curse spirits techniques ceases to grow from the moment they are absorbed, and the user can only use that technique once. For example, this is what Kenjaku's plan was during Shibuya, the growth of Mahito to such a high degree that he could absorb him and use a countrywide idol transfiguration, starting the culling game. Like I mentioned before, Curse Spirit Manipulation operates functionally the same as Shikigami Conjuring, however, no intermediary like a hand sign is required. There doesn't appear to be any limits on the number of curses that can be absorbed and it is unknown what happens to the Curse Spirits taken in after the user dies. A possible way to rid oneself of all of those curses though, is through the user's maximum technique, Uzumaki. This ability takes all of the Curse Spirits that the user of Curse Spirit Manipulation has absorbed and merges them all into one. Initially, I thought this was a beam-like ability, but Uzumaki itself takes the form of a swirling Curse Spirit that levitates behind the user. Once unleashed, it darts forward to whatever was targeted and unleashes a powerful attack of super condensed Curse Energy. Moving forward again, and I didn't know this before doing some research, but Mimiko's technique, Teddy Noose, allows you to hang her targets using a noose. Hence, you know, like those hung managers throughout Shibuya that we've seen. Although the exact mechanics of how it works is unknown, Mimiko's technique involves the usage of both the rope and her stuffed childhood toy that she keeps on her. One of the more modern implementations of a curse technique is seen when Nanako tries to use her phone and snap a picture of Sukuna. Nanako's technique, Camera Phone, allows her to manipulate a photographed subject that she takes an image of using the camera on her cell phone. She once used this ability on herself to dodge one of Jogo's attacks, but the process tied her out quickly, and it's unknown how this technique even exactly works. So, the only member from the cursed user group Q to have an ability that we might somewhat know is Baya and those knives of his. I'm calling this ability Knives Out because it sounds dope as, but I'm assuming that it's some sort of tool manipulation like ability in which you can freely manipulate knives with curse energy. Moving out of Q now and onto the professional sorcerers, I think it's fitting that with the very first professional sorcerers techniques that we go over, we start with the model example of what a grade 1 jujutsu sorcerer is. The big man, Kento Nanami, and his ability to ratio the absolute hell out of anyone he comes across. A user of ratio technique is able to mark the target's body with lines divided into tenths. If the user is able to strike one of these lines on exactly the 7 to 3 ratio point, they deliver a critical hit to the subject. This allows them to deal significant damage on strong opponents and absolutely body the hell out of anyone weaker than them. These figurative lines don't actually have to measure up to the full target's length, height or wingspan. Their head, torso, biceps and forearms are all areas that someone with this technique can individually target. On top of that, the technique doesn't have to be used on curses or people, and can even be used on inanimate objects like buildings. The only extension technique that we've seen a user of ratio ability use is Collapse. Instead of a singular target, Collapse expands the overall target area of what can be hit by the ratio technique. Simply, it creates a weak point in the surrounding environment, allowing the user to deliver a critical hit and destroy it. The impact of this technique is so powerful, it creates shockwaves of curse energy that rips through its effective hit zone. For anyone wondering why I haven't mentioned Overtime and Revealing One's Hand, well, those are just binding vowels and I'll go over the binding vowels in another separate video. 
extremely fitting to stick these two people next to each other and their abilities as this guy here, Takuma Eno, I'm pretty sure was either some kind of student or friend to Nanami in the past before becoming a professional sorcerer himself. Even now, he still insists that Nanami is the only person to recommend him for the role of Grade 1. Takuma's technique though, Auspicious Beast Summon, is extremely interesting as it plays on the idea of summoning a soul from another world. The ABS is a type of seance technique that, when the user's face is hidden from view, transforms them into a spiritual medium for that beast. From what we've seen, people with this technique can bring forth the power of the Auspicious Beasts numbers 1 through 4. Each of the beast's abilities are manifested by the user's cursed energy and can be summoned by calling out the desired beast's name and number. Unlike Shikigami or Cursed Spirit Manipulation, Auspicious Beast Summon does not create spirits to fight alongside their master. Instead, the abilities of the Auspicious Beasts are materialized through Cursed Energy for the user to utilize themselves. Auspicious Beast number 1, Kaichi, summons a horn with a spiral pattern on it. It can be fired as a homing projectile cloaked in Cursed Energy that won't stop until it hits its target. The second auspicious beast, Reiki, or Reiki, I, I don't know, covers Eno's body in cursed water that can be used to cushion him from danger and or increase his overall mobility. Auspicious beast number three, Kidden, pretty much allows the user to fight with a massively reduced sense of pain. This will drain the user's stamina simultaneously, making them extremely tired but completely unable to fall asleep. Once the beast has been summoned and whatever was needed to be done is completed, the user won't be able to function for a limited amount of time. We've never actually seen the use of this beast, so I've only been able to go off what Eno said about its powers here. Another of the beasts that we really haven't seen but know a little about, Auspicious Beast number 4, Ryu, was about to be used in Eno's battle against the Seance user. However, Toji Zenin got his ass. <laughs> Up to that point, nobody had ever survived to tell the tale after fighting Ryu, and once again that's according to Eno though, so I guess we have to go off his word there. Time for Big Sis and the creepy brother that follows her around everywhere. Man is absolutely desperate. Of course I'm talking about Mei Mei and her dope ability called Blackbird Manipulation. So as you've seen, Blackbird Manipulation allows the user to imbue crows with curse energy and control them at will. I'm not sure if it's specifically crows, but it does seem that way from what we've seen. The user of this ability can manipulate multiple crows at the same time. Additionally, the user can also share vision with the birds, making the technique perfect for surveillance. The crows that have been imbued with curse energy are under absolute control, so if needed, they can be used to strike the opponent, even at the cost of the own bird's life. So that brings us to one of the extension techniques we've seen Mei Mei use with Blackbird Manipulation. Bird Strike in order to exceed the limits of the normally weak crows, a blackbird manipulator can force their crows to commit no life. By hurling a crow imbued with curse energy beyond its normal limit, a user can unleash a devastating attack that is normally a one-hit finisher. Apparently, and according to Mei Mei, the only person that's ever been able to stop it is Gojo. When it comes to Wee Wee, the specifics of his innate technique are absolutely unknown. Mei Mei said that it allowed them to both escape the battle by transferring them from Japan to Malaysia. So I'm legit just going to go ahead and say that he has some form of teleportation or gateway-like ability. Adding more credence to this, his technique also allowed him to act as someone who could communicate with people inside and outside of the barriers during the culling game, which is, you know, impossible for other people. Someone who doesn't cap in the slightest though, and even decided to mentally ruin Sugudo Ghetto with her talk no jutsu, then beat the ass out of the guy who stole his body. Of course, I'm talking about the queen herself and most powerful professional sorcerer, the special grade Yuki Tsukumo and her star rage. First thing I need to mention is that this technique has a shikigami called Garuda associated with it. It's 100% a part of the technique, so I'm just going to label it as a kind of extension for her. Gruda can have virtual mass added to it using Star Rage, as it's the only thing affected by the curse technique other than the user. What makes it even more confusing, because it's like, is this a, a curse tool or a Shikigami, is that Star Rage transforms Garuda into a curse tool that the user can then use in battle. Gruda can also act and fight independently regardless, whether or not Star Rage is actually active, so I'm assuming that it obviously is a Shikigami. When it comes down to like her main technique, Star Rage, the primary function of it is to empower its user with the ability to add mass to themselves and the Shikigami associated with this technique. The mass added is virtual or imaginary, but it always increases the user's physical attacks with force equal to the real mass assigned to them. 
The added mass doesn't weigh down the user or its Shikigami, but it also doesn't increase their body's overall weight as well. However, there is a density threshold to how much virtual or imaginary mass the user can stack on themselves. If it's taken too far and they add way too much mass or like density to themselves, it will condense their body into a black hole with extreme gravity, ripping everything around into it. This is like no question one of the strongest abilities in this series and it just sucks that we never got to see it used in more than two battles. Plus, the first time that it did show up at the end of Shibuya, it's kind of like hard to call that a battle for Star Edge as well because it kind of just was there, it didn't do anything. Moving on to the Zenon family now, and when it comes to their household, they're meant to be known for the Ten Shadows technique. However, none of the main family's current family members were born with that inherited technique. Instead, Naobito and Naoya had a secondary inherited technique, Projection Sorcery. Just like in an anime sequence, movie or animation, this technique divides one second into 24 frames of animation using the user's field of view as a projection angle. To perform the ability, the user will trace a predetermined set of movements that take place over 24 frames and execute them in a single second. Due to how this technique works, it makes the user appear to move unnaturally fast, too quick for even special grade curse spirits to follow. However, this is technically just a fallacy. While projection sorcery is active and the sorcerer is in movement, anything touched by the user's palm must also abide by the 24 FPS rule and copy those same movements. If the opponent doesn't follow those specific rules, it results in the subject getting immobilized and frozen in an animation frame for one second. Although it's just a second, anything caught in that frame is completely vulnerable to attack, allowing people to land free hits on it. Hitting the frame will break the target out of it. Catching someone in the frame won't do any damage to them in itself, so the sorcerer using this ability still needs to somewhat be physically strong. After the user decides on their movements, the predetermined course cannot be adjusted. On top of that, if the trajectory of movements or the laws of physics are excessively ignored, the user will be frozen in a frame for one second. Next up, and brother to Naobito, Ogi Zenin always thought he was unlucky and hard done by in life. He never received the Ten Shadows technique or projection sorcery, and was always outclassed by his older brother. Still, somehow he thought that he was the one who deserved to be the head of the family, and that's why I think he decided to name his innate technique, Blazing Courage. Blazing Courage allows the user to ignite flames of curse energy and channel them through their weapon to create a flaming sword. Blazing Courage can be used to replace a broken blade and can even slice through objects as a sword would. If the user infuses more curse energy into the technique, it will generate scorching flames that encircle them and coat their blade. Next up out of the people instead of the Zenin clan with some form of technique, so don't expect to hear about the Kukuru squad anytime soon, Ranta Zenin and his paralyzing gaze. Pretty much from what we could see, Paralyzing Gaze is an ability that catches anyone the user gazes upon in an immobilizing aura. On top of that, large eyes that emit the Paralyzing Gaze are imagined behind the opponent. These eyes work as an intermediary between the sorcerer and the opponent, so if someone manages to break the hold and in turn those eyes, it could backfire with devastating consequences. Next up out of the Zenins, Jinichi and his massive missile fists technique. As the name implies, Missile Fists is an extremely destructive technique in which the user is able to conjure a number of giant fists that are propelled by curse energy, like a missile. Lastly, out of the Zenin family members, Chojuro Zenin and his ability to manipulate the Earth. Chojuro's Earth Arms technique allows him to manipulate the Earth to some degree. To do this, the user touches the ground with both hands and activates the ability. From what we've seen this ability do, it's only able to create large stone hands, but I'm sure there's probably some more utility to it that we never got to see. Moving on from the Zenins, and when it comes to the King of Curses himself, it's currently unknown what Sukuna's curse technique is called. Throughout this series, he's been shown to use his curse energy to perform two types of slashes. The reason we don't know if this is his innate technique or not is because he has such a high level of control over curse energy. Most characters will take days to unlock a new ability. For Sukuna though, all it takes is one glance at how it was achieved to do it himself. On top of the base standard slashing attack Sukuna was seen using, he's also been shown to use fire-based powers that originate from another dimension. When it comes to the slashing attacks though, Dismantle is an attack that is normally used for inanimate objects. The attack doesn't work on cursed spirits or sorcerers unless they are no longer considered alive. It may also work on Maki as cursed energy sees her as an inanimate object. 
Secondary of the two slashes, Cleave, is in an attack that adjusts the level of curse energy needed depending on the target's toughness to cut them down in one go. Possibly another otherworldly ability or even his innate technique, Fire Arrow is an ability that allows the user to open some form of black box to create and manipulate flames. These flames are then formed into an arrow and shot at whoever the intended target is. Throughout the series, not a single person, even though it's only been shot once, I guess, has ever survived these flames. After gaining Megami's body, we saw the King of Curses use a multitude of new abilities that we hadn't seen him use before. The first of these, Spiderweb, allows the user to utilize Cleave, but in a spiderweb-like pattern. As a variation of Cleave, this technique can also adjust its destructive force to take out the intended opponent or surroundings in one blow. When it comes to the Ten Shadows technique, Sukuna actually expanded on what we originally knew was even possible. He made the technique seem otherworldly and even summoned other Shikigami we never saw Megami conjure up. The first of these ancient Shikigami, Piercing Ox, is as the name says, an Ox Shikigami that can charge down opponents with frightening speed. Due to how we've seen it summoned, it can only move in a straight line, but the longer its charge, the more powerful its hits will be. It's also extremely robust and was able to take a few blows from a special grade Heian Period Sorcerer before vanishing. Second is the Round Deer. This beast is a towering deer Shikigami that can automatically heal itself and the master through reverse curse technique. The positive curse energy that flows through the Shikigami is powerful enough to cause another sorcerer to lose control of whatever they might be doing. Of course as well, with it like being positive energy and like Maharaga, I say that Round Deer is also a great option for battling curse spirits. Lastly, out of the extra add-ins to the Ten Shadows technique, unless you want to like talk about what he did with freaking Niue over there, is an improved humanoid version of Niue again. This merged beast Agito inherited the powers of the Great Serpent, Tiger Funeral, and Round Deer. It is a large, powerful Shikigami capable of producing electricity and regenerating lost limbs with reverse curse technique. This reverse curse technique can, you know, just like uh, the deer, work on its master. Also, I might as well mention this here, but we did technically get the 10th Shikigami revealed to us. Its name, Tiger Funeral, doesn't really give much away apart from the fact that it's got something to do with a tiger and there were some tiger-like markings on Agito. So, yeah. Moving over to the oldest lady in the history of Jujutsu Kaisen, Big Thumbgen. Being the oldest person in the verse, Tengen has the ability of immortality. This technique obviously grants the user eternal life. However, it does not stop the aging process. In order to keep living past this point, their body and technique must be reset every 500 years. Hence what happened throughout the Gojo Past arc. Moving on to the previous lover of Tengen and the backshot king, Kenjaku has been around for as long if not longer because of his special ability, body swapping. Kenjaku's innate technique allows him to swap bodies with another person, even if they are dead, by transplanting his brain into the body of his target. After the transplant is complete, this technique leaves a stitched scar running across the user's head. The user is at any time able to remove the top part of their head and reveal their true self as well. Once inside a body, the user of body swapping will gain access to the host's curse energy, all of their innate techniques and memories. Even the six eyes won't be able to recognize him as an imposter since he is the original user's curse energy. As shown with his usage of Kaori's technique while fighting against Choso and Yuki, it's been hinted that even when switching to a new body, a body swapping user retains access and usage of his former host's innate curse techniques. This can't be abused too much though as the limit of former host's innate techniques the user can store is up to four, and Kenjaku was only able to store four because like, his technique is a brain, you know, so he's able to do more than most people. One of these stolen innate techniques from a former host, the anti-gravity system is freaking broken and probably, probably my favorite ability in the series because it's gravity. The exact function of how Kaori Itadori's technique worked still isn't fully explored, so it's hard to exactly pin down on how Kenjaku's version of it might work. But what we all need to understand is that what we saw him use is the reversal of her curse technique. In theory, I'm assuming that Kaori's anti-gravity turned off the gravity around her and allowed the user to send people shooting off in some sort of vacuum. What we saw was the reversal of that, where the user instead forces an insane amount of gravitational forces down for approximately 6 seconds. On top of that, the gravitational forces don't seem to affect the user, but are able to stop the effects of pretty much any ability, including a freaking black hole. This ability, just because of like how unknown it is, still seems so interesting to me and I'd love to get another feature in an upcoming battle so we can find out more on it. 
The fact that this could be an ability that Yuji could possibly have in the future because his mum had it as well as mental. Like, is it possible dude could go from having no abilities to just being stacked up with like two or three different innate curse techniques because of how his body is structured? I'd love to know your thoughts on this one down below for sure. And if you think I misunderstood, please be sure to let me know because this technique is pretty mind boggling. <laughs> Sticking with uh, the other members of Kenjaku's squad and someone who actually turned out to be Sukuna's close acquaintance. The Ice Queen Arume has one of the most versatile abilities in the series. Ice Formation As you could imagine, this ice based technique allows the user to lower the temperature around them to extreme levels. These freezing temperatures then allow them to produce ice and frost at will. The user can generate multiple sheets of solid ice by simply touching a surface. They can also manifest other forms of ice such as a cloud of frozen mist or a massive block of ice that falls from the sky. Any ice or extremely cold substance can also be freely manipulated by the user. A baseline ability of ice formation, Frost Calm, lowers the temperature of the air around the user allowing them to channel a frosted mist to their hand. The user then brings the hand up to their mouth and blows on that frozen mist. This in turn creates a cloud of icy mist that shoots towards their target. As the cloud of icy mist moves forward, anything that it touches instantly gets frozen, enabling the user to trap their opponent. While trapped and covered in several layers of ice, one wrong move might result in them getting cut by the razor sharp icicles that now surround them. Just like with the previous technique, Icefall allows the user to lower the temperature of the air around their hand, covering it with a thin layer of ice. With this extremely low temperature, the ice formation user is able to generate massive amounts of ice on any surface they touch. On top of that, the user can break apart the ice using their mind and levitate it through the air. If they manage to hit their opponent, the user can freeze their target on contact covering their body with a thick layer of hard ice. Once trapped again, the user's opponents are finished off by large icicles that fly forth and skewer their frozen bodies. Next up on the list, we got the Creeper King himself, Big Haruta Shigimo and his crazy innate technique, Miracles. I think it's pretty obvious here that Gige needed someone to just bait on for a little bit, so we legit created a technique that revolves around miracles. The idea for this technique works by erasing all of the little everyday miracles one might have, like seeing a clock randomly hit all of the same digits, along with the memory of it from the user's brain and stores them away. Once stored away, these lines appear under the user's eyes with a maximum of 6 miracles being allowed per day. These stored up miracles are released when the user's life is in danger, altering their luck to ensure that they survive lethal events. Finally, when a miracle has been used, the markings turn to white, signifying that it is empty. Weirdly, when it comes to the people that can take a hit head on and make it seem as though they're absolutely fine, this old man, Jiro Awasaka and his averse technique is the perfect example. While activated, Inverse makes it so that all damage against the user is reversed. Simply enough, strong blows become weak and weak ones become strong while the technique is activated. Due to how ridiculous it would be if this technique inversed everything that like happened on the user, there is a minimum and maximum limit to these conditions. Fourth and final from Kenjaku's group to have a known technique, Ogami with her seance technique came into the story during Shibuya and absolutely flipped it on its head. The seance technique grants the user the ability to contact the dead and summon their body or soul's information to the living world. This is done by having someone consume a part of a deceased sorcerer while the user performs a ritual behind them. Transforming it into someone using their body's information allows the shapeshifter to utilize their physical abilities. The technique is supposed to signal its own end when the shapeshifter's curse energy runs out, however there can be complications if the wrong person is resurrected. Once we entered the culling game, Mr. Gigeo Kotami decided to introduce a flurry of new characters that have some of the most exciting curse techniques seen yet. One of these guys, and probably the strongest reincarnation, Hajime Kashimo had a one use innate technique that would subsequently end his life once it finishes. To enable himself to fight without having to rely on this technique, the ancient sorcerer took advantage of his unique electrified curse energy. A side effect of his curse energy, so it's not really a uh, curse technique, but lightning discharge works by applying a positive charge to his target. The user is then able to discharge the negative charge without having any of that electricity hit the ground. In turn, this creates a powerful lightning-like ability that cuts through the sky and is almost guaranteed to hit anyone in its way. The only way they'd actually dodge is if they could physically move faster than lightning though, so it's fairly lethal and probably Gojo would be the only person able to stop it with his infinity. 
when it comes to his one-time use innate technique, Mythical Beast Amber. It is a release technique that reconstructs the user's body in order to bring forth any effect that can be created by electricity. Once activated, it can't be deactivated and will use up all of the curse energy that that user had, as the user's body will evolve into something far beyond the human form. There isn't any specific extension ability connected with this attack, just side effects. These side effects increase the brain's activity, making it work faster, optimize sound and tuning waves to match normal frequencies, and vaporize irradiated objects using electromagnetic waves. Next up, we've got the actual G himself and Yuji's new right-hand battleman, Hiromi Higuruma, and his innate technique, Deadly Sentencing. I can't actually wait to see what happens like in the upcoming manga with this. So you will know exactly where I am right now, just to age this video a little bit. Since Deadly Sentencing is linked to the user's domain expansion by default, I'll just slightly mention it here. If you want more, I'll make a video going over every known domain expansion, Binding Vow, and I've already done Barrier Technique, so you can check that video out if you want right here. Either way, Deadly Sentencing manifests a small courtroom domain surrounded by guillotines where the user and their opponent are placed on podiums standing across from one another. This domain does not use a guaranteed hit, instead anyone inside is simply forced to follow its rules. Continuing with the lore type theme of his domain, it also incorporates a Shikigami known as Judgment, who obviously takes that judge role. As it may suggest, Deadly Sentencing is a court based ability where the target is placed on a stand and interrogated. If found guilty, they could face a multitude of different consequences, with the worst being the death penalty. On a lighter note though, and someone who's able to rid the darkness from people's hearts, Hanakurasu is able to wield Angel's innate technique, known as Nullification. Pretty much, this technique is able to nullify any and all curses, including curse techniques, barriers, and seals. In addition, the user might be able to revert incarnated humans whose bodies have been fused with like curse objects back to their original state. There are a lot of complications with this though, and it would most likely result in the original vessel's body dying, so that's why you haven't seen it happen so far. When it comes to Hunter's maximum output technique, Jacob's Ladder, this ability conjures a four-winged trumpet made of light under the user's mouth, then an enormous magic circle of light in the sky above the user's head. This magical circle then features a large heptagram or seven-pointed star in the middle and crosses along its outer edge. Upon sounding the trumpet, the user creates a beam of light that shoots down from the middle of the circle to engulf whatever is below. Any curse technique will be extinguished under the light and incarnation is also susceptible, as proven like when Sukuna's host body started corroding, you know, under the uh, effects of this attack. But, you know, who, who actually knows if he was just faking it or not right there. Next up, and we've got the big man, the legend himself, big Fumihiko Takaba and his insane innate technique, Comedian. This technique is f it's just broken, man. In short, it allows the user to manifest whatever they think is funny into reality. Like, it's something that can actually compare to Gojo's technique. It's that broken when you just think this man can create anything he thinks is funny and put it into reality. The effects of this technique cover a wide variety, including, and like not being limited to, conjuring objects or substances from absolutely nothing, healing themselves without the use of reverse curse technique, and nullifying damage done to them. Despite the extraordinary power granted by this technique, Comedian can only be activated if the user remains confident and certain in their ability to be funny. As a result, if the user loses confidence in their humor, the technique will be deactivated and render them vulnerable to attacks. Time for the hair extension curse technique users, Hanyu and Haba. Hanyu's curse technique, airplane hair, changes the user's hair into the shape of a jet plane with two boosters strong enough to propel someone through the air at high speed. Just due to like how this curse technique works and having all of the curse energy in their hair, other sections of their body are less protected by curse energy and therefore vulnerable while the technique is activated. Just like Hanyu, Hubba's curse technique, helicopter hair, changed his hair into a propeller with four blades. By activating it, a user of helicopter hair can fly around and suspend themselves in the air with ease. They are also able to adjust the length and angle of their propellers as well as increase its rotation speed and toughness. Like Hanyu, it's likely that Hubba's curse energy is mainly focused on his hair, making him susceptible to body attacks as well. I actually completely forgot to add this person in to start with, so luckily on a second check through of all the people, I remember that Remy is actually a part of the hair manipulation gang with her scorpion hair. Remy's technique, scorpion hair, allows the user to manipulate their hair into a scorpion-like tail that can attack their opponents. Sadly for users of this technique, it seems to be extremely weak, However, that was probably just due to like Remy's lack of curse energy as well. 
Following the hair manipulators, we've got a man who's able to dupe the absolute hell out of any receipts he finds. No need to buy anything when you've got Reggie Star and his contractual recreation technique to just make it out of thin air for you. As the name suggests, contractual recreation uses contracts such as receipts to produce anything written on them. This manifests the main or most expensive item on those receipts. It can produce pretty much anything written on them, but from what we have seen tends to be the items or services. An item could be anything from a TV to an axe, whereas a service might be a getaway retreat or a spa vacation that the user could instantly activate and take the healing effects from. Things the user recreates sort of acts like a shikigami with given commands. For example, if someone summons a few missiles with a receipt, the user can order them with their mind to do a certain action. After they finish this action though, that summoning will disappear and no longer be visible. In order to activate contractual recreation, the user must apply their curse energy to the contract or receipt and burn it. The downside to this technique is that water heavily debuffs the sorcerer. If they happen to get any of the receipts wet, then it will be almost impossible to ignite them with curse energy. Who I'm assuming could be considered the second strongest sorcerer inside of Reggie's group? Iori Hazanoke is an extremely durable character who only recently kicked the bucket thanks to Kenjaku. And you know, I, I didn't actually get to include him in my All Deaths video because he only died like two weeks ago. Hazanoke's innate technique, Explosive Flesh, allows him to remotely detonate his own body parts and use them as bombs. To do this, a user of the Explosive Flesh technique can remove parts of their body and throw them as projectiles that will explode on command. To stop a user of this ability running out of limbs before they even make it out of preschool, a reverse curse technique to replace the lost body parts makes it simple for a user of this ability to regrow anything. Most forgettable, I'd say from Reggie's group apart from maybe Remy, just due to how quickly Megami dunked on this dude, Chizuru Harai has probably one of the most useless techniques that makes an appearance during the culling game. Chizuru's technique, Claws, allows him to shift his fingers into dark claws. It's hard to say if the offensive side of this ability had any effects while fighting, as the dude really never got to show it off. Pretty much all we got to see was that users of this ability can also climb walls using their claws, which is pretty damn pathetic. Finally, someone with a little bit of potency again, the legend himself and man with the largest curse energy output in the entire culling game, Ryu Ishigori. Ryu's technique, Curse Energy Discharge, is a pretty straightforward technique. It allows the user to discharge directed beams of compressed curse energy like a cannon. In preparation to fire, the blast has to be charged up in order to build up a large enough concentration of curse energy into a singular point. The strength of the output of blast depends on how much time was allowed for it to build up. Then, finally once it does fire, the beams can take several forms depending on the user's desires. For example, Curse Energy can be fired as a full power blast capable of decimating several city blocks or a volley of multiple rapid blasts to take out the user's targets. Granite Blast is the most powerful and straightforward application of Curse Energy Discharge. It is a long ranged, extremely powerful blast wave of highly concentrated Curse Energy that can easily destroy an entire city block. The more Curse Energy that is charged into Granite Blast, the larger and more deadly its attack range becomes. Next up, we've got the series' longest living hater and someone who just can't seem to let things go, Takako Uro and her sky manipulation technique. It's been like 400 years and the first thing she does each time she sees some strong dude is accuse them of being a Fujiwara scumbag, which you know I love, it's pretty funny. Either way, Takako's technique grants her the ability to control the sky, hence sky manipulation. A user of this ability can turn the sky into a tangible surface and use it to manipulate space, similar to like how a lens creates distortion. I'm going to chuck like this description in here of like what distortion exactly is and how it works because it actually helps with understanding this technique a little bit more and these, these images also like give a great example. Distortion commonly occurs from deviations or anomalies near the edge of an image. Each type of distortion usually develops through different variables. Barrel distortion for example is often the result of a lens at full zoom, while pinch cushion distortion occurs most often from telephoto lenses. A user of sky manipulation can casually use it to levitate themselves and hide behind portions of manipulated sky. In battle, a user can defend themselves by distorting the shape of the sky around their opponent's attacks. The surfaces that a sky manipulator controls can't crush anyone directly, so instead a user can break the surface of the sky with an attack called Thin Icebreaker. This ability creates a shattering effect that cracks the surface of the sky like thin ice and hits the target with some form of multiplied force. 
Lastly are the culling game players who were introduced and someone who is in my opinion a Giga Katami self insert, Charles Bernard and his manga style technique G War Staff. Okay, so again with like me being a little bit confused over sh should I include this or not? Because technically G War Staff is a curse tool that is directly tied to Charles' innate technique. But we continue on either way because it, it makes sense. Due to him being a mangaka, the item is a long spear with a pen shaped tip. By hitting their opponent and getting some blood on the pen's tip, a user of this technique can fulfill the conditions for ink, after which they can use that ink to mark their opponent with a manga panel. This panel is taken directly from one second in the future, allowing the user to see their opponent's upcoming actions. If a user of G War Staff can draw more blood from their opponent, then it will increase the amount of time they can peer into the future. Moving on now from the techniques that were introduced to us throughout the culling game along with just those sorcerers in general, in this last section we will delve into all of the techniques seen from Cursed Spirit so far inside of Jujutsu Kaisen. Also I'm pretty sure that only special grades, vengeful cursed spirits and the death paintings have cursed techniques so this list isn't nearly as large as the human side of things. Starting things off though and just due to them sharing a bunch of techniques is the brothers Iso and Kichizu. So both Iso and Kichizu possess the Rot technique. This ability plays on the curse's dark and toxic blood. Simply, it's poisonous to humans and corrodes anything it touches, capable of burning skin on impact and eating away at solid rock. This here is probably just due to their half-human side being from the Kamo family and having that affinity in their blood to, you know, like hurt curse spirits, so now it's been reversed to hurt humans. Additionally, utilizing the Rot technique also grants the user the ability to manipulate their blood in various ways. The blood can be shaped into weapons or used to poison someone and decay their body over time. Speaking of decay, decay was a technique both of the brothers possessed. This ability creates a floral pattern on the target that quickly begins eating away at their body. Anyone who takes in the blood of a rot technique user through membranes or wounds can be affected with this technique. This can also spread to other people if accidentally touched. Sorcerers or curse users who get afflicted by this technique are said to be killed in less than 15 minutes. Last of the Cursed Worms known techniques, Rock Technique Maximum, Wing King, which was only seen from ESO, manipulates the user's blood and shapes it into large wasp-like wings. These wings can be used to create paths of blood which can be used for offensive purposes or to increase the user's maneuverability. When the lines of blood connect with their target, they are instantly burned by the corrosive effects of the blood. This in turn will also afflict them with the Decay Technique. When it comes to these special grade curses, some of them have the most complex abilities in the series. One of those, Ganesha, has a technique that is able to target concepts itself, whatever the hell that means. Just due to how short of a time this curse was in the story, the ins and outs of how obstacle removal work isn't exactly known. Kenjaku described Ganesha's ability as the power to remove obstacles and target concepts. So I'm assuming that the curse itself is probably able to remove anything from an area and place it in another, along with targeting the idea or concept behind a curse technique. For example, Kenjaku had the curse use its removal ability to remove a bunch of dudes blocking its path in the White House, then in its battle against Yuki the curse tried to target and remove the concept of her technique, however the overwhelming mass was too much and the curse failed to do so. Second of the known special grade curses in the list, Kuroroshi the Cockroach is an utterly terrifying force. Kuroroshi's curse technique, Cursed Cockroaches, can produce and manipulate countless swarms of real cockroaches reinforced by its curse energy. These man-eating cockroaches are able to strip the flesh of a group of humans in a matter of seconds. Doing this actually feeds Kuroroshi's endless appetite and, in turn, stimulates his extension technique, Parthenogenesis. Kuroroshi's parthenogenesis process grants the cursed spirit the ability to produce even more cockroaches. On top of that, the cursed spirit can use this process to reproduce an identical yet entirely new cursed spirit. However, in order to preserve the original cockroach's existence, the cursed energy from the parent is passed on to the child when it dies and so on. Last of the cockroaches known techniques, Earthen Insect Trance allows the cursed spirit to conjure up flying insects that carry large sacks filled with a liquid substance that gets released when destroyed. If the Cursed Spirit's opponent gets too like sloppy when taking out one of these uh, little insects right here, and the substance does happen to get into the target's eyes, it will start to impair their vision, making it easier for the curse to win. Third out of the known special grades, Smallpox Deity is one of the stronger curses inside of Kenjaku's storage of Cursed Spirits. Smallpox Deity's curse technique, Gravestone, begins when it traps its target inside a cramped coffin. After the target is caught, the curse takes its left fist and lowers it into its right hand. 
This motion drops a giant gravestone on top of the coffin, dealing heavy damage and burying the coffin underground. Once the gravestone is placed underground, the disease curse begins to count down from 3. If the count reaches 1, the target will be infected with the smallpox and die. It's unknown how long it takes for the target to obviously die once infected, but you know, it, it will happen, they will eventually die. Dagon is one of the main threats that make their appearance during Shibuya. If it wasn't for Toji showing up, it's likely that a few of the main group could have died fighting this curse here. Its technique, Disaster Tides, allows the user to manifest high volumes of water and control it using their curse energy. It can be used as a water shield for close and mid range and as a large sweeping wave for long range combat. Its efficiency is dependent upon the curse energy of the user and for that reason can only be utilized to its full potential by someone adept in curse energy manipulation. Weakest out of the disaster curses, but still special grade rank, so you know, don't forget that. Hanami is equipped with a range of abilities that, if not taken seriously, will deal serious damage. Hanami's innate technique allows the user to form and control a variety of cursed fauna. Its abilities are normally initiated with one's mind by activating the technique next to the intended target or on the user themselves. All of the plants that make up disaster plants are made from curse energy, meaning that all creations can be constructed and deactivated instantly. The technique also grants the user the ability to absorb the life energy from real plants. They can then take that energy, turn it into like a sort of flower offering and finally convert it into curse energy that the user can then use. One of the main extension techniques, Root, can create large tree roots that emerge from the ground at will. If an army decides to limit the reach and number of roots made, the overall power and speed of the other roots will increase. Obviously this works both ways and if an army also decides to greatly expand the number of roots and their range, it will be at the sacrifice of speed and the destructive power. As the name says, Wooden Ball allows Hanami to create a singular or multiple Wooden Balls from Curse Energy. These Wooden Balls will then shoot out one or two sharp branch attacks in an attempt to skewer their target. The Disaster Curse is also able to use this technique to suspend herself in mid-air. The Cursed Bud is an attack that launches flower buds that feed on the Curse Energy of whoever it attaches to. The more techniques someone afflicted with a bud uses, the deeper the bud roots will extend into their body, feeding off more Cursed Energy. There is like also the option of spawning a large flower that can shoot a massive barrage of these cursed buds. The last technique that we saw Hanami use, Flower Fields, as the name would suggest, can create a circle of flowers around their opponent that distracts them with an effect that removes their will to fight. Hanami was also able to use this technique remotely by launching a long range projectile that the ability activated off. The only downside to this ability is that if the user is weakened, then flower fields won't be as effective at removing the opponent's will to fight. Possibly the strongest out of the disaster curses, Gocho or Cho Goat is equipped with a few techniques that would put pretty much any sorcerer apart from Gojo on the back foot. The curse's innate technique, Disaster Flames, allows the user to form and control both fire and lava. The flames are immensely powerful, capable of instantly killing non-sorcerers and critically injuring sorcerers. These flames are visible to non-sorcerers and also possess similar properties to real flames. The technique also grants the user the ability to telepathically create miniature volcanoes on any surface. These volcanoes are capable of firing powerful lava towards the user's intended target. One of the first techniques we saw a curse actually use in this story, Ember Insects, allows Jogo to summon small flying insect-like curses from the volcanic opening in his head. These curses had a large stinger that produced a loud noise upon impact before detonating into a flaming explosion. Jogo's maximum technique, Meteor, generates a gigantic flaming meteor that the user is able to hurl at their target. The meteor's size probably depends entirely on how much curse energy the curse is willing to like put into the attack. If this attack lands, the impact it causes is on a like completely new level in terms of destructive force in Jujutsu Kaisen. It's without question will destroy entire sections of a city and is even strong enough to wound a 15 finger Sukuna. Knowing what I know now about Sukuna though, I'm questioning if he was just gassing Jogo up or like not. I'd love to know your thoughts on it below. Either way, I think this is like obviously what makes him the most potent disaster curse. Getting towards the, I guess the rear end of this video now, and on the final of four disaster curses, we have the maniacal maniac himself, Mahito. As you all probably know, this dude was equipped with Idol Transfiguration, one of the most broken abilities in Shonen. Imagine if he was actually good for real, this, this dude could have saved an entire hospital of kids or something. 
Idle Transfiguration allows the user to reshape the soul of themselves or anyone they physically touch. The shape of the body is dependent on the shape of the soul. So if the soul is distorted, then the body will also distort. Therefore, someone using Idle Transfiguration can disfigure their target's body into a hellish creature by warping their soul's shape with just one touch. This process creates what are known as transfigured humans. The only way to block this technique is by being physically built differently. Weak sorcerers stand absolutely zero chance and even grade 1 sorcerers will transfigure after a touch or two. First of Mahito's creative techniques, Soul Multiplicity, which is kind of like a base technique that others work off, combines two or more souls using Idle Transfiguration. By slamming these two souls together, it creates a reaction due to the unnatural course of soul fusion taking place. This here, as I mentioned, allows the user to derive more techniques that take advantage of the reaction. One of these extension techniques, Body Repel, takes advantage of Soul Multiplicity's reaction. By increasing the energy of the souls associated with this effect, the user can generate an overwhelming wave of transfigured humans that burst forth. Again utilizing Soul Multiplicity, the user this time combines all of his useless souls with weak rejection to create one body. This body and technique is called the Polymorphic Soul Isomer. A Polymorphic Soul Isomer is an attack based transfiguration with extremely deadly force. However, the trade off for its crazy strength is its lack of durability. A Polymorphic Soul Isomer can easily be killed with a single direct hit using Cursed Energy. The Instant Spirit Body of Distorted Killing is a special self-transfiguration that morphs the user into a much, much more powerful state. Due to the nature of like idle transfiguration and its connection to the soul, Instant Spirit Body of Distorted Killing can only be achieved when the user realizes the truest essence of their being. This technique not only greatly alters the user's appearance, but also increases their abilities, granting them incredible offensive and defensive prowess. Finally, last on the list of every curse technique inside of Jujutsu Kaisen, we've got the one vengeful curse who has an ability that isn't a domain expansion, you know, it's just a curse technique, Curse Naoya. As a vengeful curse spirit, Naoya somehow managed to retain his innate technique, but I've decided to call it Cursed Projection Sorcery just to be, you know, edgy and cool. During his short time as a curse, it was shown to be greatly improved on by his cursed spirit's body. An extension technique that he created as a curse spirit, Acceleration Mode, allows a curse to bring an air through the inlets they might have as they fly. One can then use the thrusting pressure and their own curse energy to eject the air out for an increased speed. This is a very specific technique designed for the vengeful Naoya and I doubt anyone else would ever be able to do something similar. So that there does officially bring us to like the end of every single curse technique in Jujutsu Kaisen. If you want me to make like videos going over all of the domains and all of like the cursed tools inside of Jujutsu Kaisen and all like those kind of videos and stuff, let me know down in the comment section below. And I'd also love to know what your favorite ability or curse technique throughout Jujutsu Kaisen could be. Is it an innate technique like 10 shadows or you know is it something different and it actually comes from say a curse like the the concepts one that ganesha had which i thought was pretty interesting or the anti-gravity domain that uh kaori itadori had which is another amazing domain i'd love to know all your thoughts in the comment section below and if you can smash a like on this video i've noticed that for some reason now when you say like it starts glowing around the like button so just hit it for me and check it out down below also subscribe that thing glows too which is crazy youtube's updating heaps of features at the moment they're trying to trying to fix everyone getting mad because they're removing ad block which is crazy i can't believe they're actually doing it by the way end of the video i need to stop yarning on for now it's been your professional degenerate diavolo and i will see you all in a bits bye